Consider your gifts. Name your gifts. What gifts you have, your humor, your patience, your love of beauty, your trust, are not simply for you. They are for the common good. Jesus did not turn water into wine for himself. Your spiritual gifts are whatever ways the spirit moves within you. Maybe a talent or ability. Maybe just the way you come at the world and hold space for others. Your gifts also include what you think of as weakness. Your ready tears, your slow pace, your silence. The world needs those too. The community needs your gifts, needs all of who you are. Not the pretend parts, the things you do to fit in or to keep people from reacting, but the real you, spirit alive in you. That you is the you the world needs. And so this day, consider your gifts, name your gifts, and then give your gifts away. Amen. Good morning, Stone Village, and happy Sunday. I hope that all of you are well and safe in this world. All is well in my world. The Lord be with you, and let us pray. Prepare us, O God, to hear your word through the scripture of this day. Confront us with your claim upon our lives. Clarify the choices we must make if our lives are to have meaning and purpose. Help us to respond to the one who came as the bread of life, so we may know life at its fullest and at its very best. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The reading today is from Luke chapter 12, verses 13 through 21. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But Jesus said to the man, Friend, who set me to be a judge over you? And he said to all of them, Take care, be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Then he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly. And he thought to himself, what should I do? For I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. <laughs> but God said to him, you fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you. In the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich toward God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So, what's so bad about building bigger barns? When you think of it, if you had, had a bountiful harvest, isn't it prudent to build bigger barns to store the additional crops so nothing goes to waste? Isn't such an action just good stewardship? Why then does God call the, the rich farmer a fool? I don't believe God's assessment of the farmer has anything to do with wealth. In fact, Jesus in today's lesson doesn't warn against wealth or abundance. He does though warn against greed, the insatiable feeling of never having enough, which I imagine we've all experienced from time to time. And so if the farmer's affliction isn't his bountiful harvest or his wealth or his planning for the future, what is the problem? As I see it, the farmer's problem 
is his good fortune has impaired his vision. In that, everything he sees begins and ends with himself. There's no evidence there's anyone else in his life, anyone else to care about, anyone else who might benefit from his bountiful harvest. All he can think about is himself and how to ensure a comfortable future. Listen again to the conversation he has with himself. What should I do? For I have no place to store my crops. I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, <laughs> you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. It is an absolutely egocentric conversation, which illustrates the farmer has fallen prey to the notion that life, particularly the good life, consists of possessions. Further and more alarming, it seems he has perhaps grown apathetic, perhaps blind to the needs of life around him. He only considers his own interest his own needs, and his own desires. He illustrates no concern beyond the contentment of his own soul. He has no empathy for others, no sense of the needs of his neighbors, no sense of how his blessings could be a blessing to others, no sense of connection to anyone. In this sense, he is a fool, locked in his own little world and oblivious to all but himself. It's easy, of course, to see the foolishness of the farmer's ways, to pass judgment upon him, to laugh at his egocentric nature, to scoff at his notion of a good life. But how do we avoid the same fate ourselves? How, that is, do we avoid forgetting God always blesses us so we may be a blessing to others? How do we avoid believing our blessings, whether of health, of achievement, or of wealth, are not ours to keep? but are gifts from God intended to be shared generously with life around us? I don't believe there's an easy answer. I don't have a solid three-step gospel plan to offer you. <laughs> the great allure of wealth, be it monetary wealth or material wealth, is both offers a false sense of self-sufficiency security, and identity. Plus, as you know, our culture feeds on our inborn insecurities. Buy more, feel better, save more, feel better. And intellectually, I believe we know wealth does not equate to happiness or the good life. And yet we still struggle to live beyond the allure of more, more money, more stuff. God, though, expects more of us, demands more of our lives. God, to paraphrase Martin Luther, needs neither our good works nor our wealth, but our neighbors do. So here's my idea, and I admit it's relatively simple. What's the one constant Jesus, Jesus speaks to across the Gospels? And here's a hint, it's not faith. <laughs> and I just alluded to it in my paraphrase of Martin Luther. The answer is community. 
After all, the whole parable started by a break in community. The central and primary community of society, a family. One brother comes seeking Jesus' intervention in a family squabble about an inheritance. And Jesus will have none of it. Recognizing what should have been an occasion for celebration, remembrance, and gratitude, the giving and sharing of an inheritance, has instead turned into a moment of division. And Jesus refuses to get involved directly. So instead, he tells the story of a man so enraptured with his good fortune, he ends up all alone in the world. From Genesis onward, the biblical witness testifies, we are created to be in community. We are at our best and most fulfilled when we live into our identity as beloved and mutually interdependent children of God. You see, we need one another. And I realize in our world today, it has become increasingly difficult to trust one another. And we are increasingly afraid to love our neighbor, especially our neighbors who we, ca who we categorize as enemies. And yet, fear of others will not lead us forward. Which is why I believe the Bible is so emphatic and relentless in regards to warning us against our fear. Be not afraid. It is not simply a means to bolster our individual courage, but to make it easier for us to turn to one another with our fears, our hopes, our dreams, and our needs in order to build community. Because it's hard to care for your neighbor and create community when you are afraid. And so one thing we might do this day, or in the days to come, I'll give you some time, is to seek out the community of others, the company of others specifically those unlike ourselves, and remain open to their needs and how we have the capability to bless their lives. Don't get me wrong, community is not easy. <laughs> people are not easy. Lord, people are not easy. Yet God intends we do not do this life alone which I think the farmer, rich in possessions, yet absolutely dirt poor in relationships, never understood. And I doubt any one of you has a desire to be dirt poor in this life, nor have God label you a fool. And so reflect on your blessings, name them, offer them. What we practice, we become. Become a blessing. Saint Augustine once said, God gave us people to love and things to use. And sin, in short, is the confusion of these two things. Thanks be to God. Amen. I give thanks to God for each of you. And I pray this day you bear witness to the love of God in this world. Bear witness to the love of God so those to whom love is a stranger, they will find in you a generous and loving friend. In the name of Christ Jesus, the power of the Holy Spirit, amen. I love you, stoners. I hope you have a great day, and uh, I'll see you soon. Bye.